Good afternoon, Excellencies, dear partners, friends and colleagues. Thank you very much for joining us in person and um, also online. Um, I think in today's global context, we know that the issue of human security is, is more important than ever. So that's why it's a pleasure to welcome you at this event. And I also hope that this is a start of an exchange on solutions and recommendations and how we actually make this happen. Um, at the Maison de la Paix here in person, and also we have over 250 people joining us online. And uh, the topic of our launch today is the new UNDP special report on human security, which is entitled New Threats to Human Security in the Anthropocene and Demanding Greater Solidarity. Um, we are very pleased to have such an audience and the colleagues online, and um, we will uh, address some of the questions. So please hold your questions to the end. And um, I will, in a minute, introduce the flow of the event and some of our distinguished guests. But before that, let me invite you to look at the short video that will give you the context. In 1994, the concept of human security refocused debate from protecting territory to protecting people and what we care about most, our basic needs, our physical integrity, our human dignity. So everyone could live free from want, fear and indignity. As a byproduct of how we pursued development, a new generation of threats has emerged, including including inequality, digital dangers, health challenges, and violent conflict. What has become clear since 1994 is that we live in the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch where the pressures exerted by people are influencing the planet's climate and ecosystems, increasing the risk of food insecurity, disasters, and zoonotic diseases, creating new problems and making existing ones worse. The severity of these threats and the fragility of our development gains has created a spiral of human insecurity. Even before COVID, six in seven people across the world, including developed countries, felt insecure. Trust between each other is in decline. And fragmented and protectionist approaches, unable to solve the interconnected challenges, are resulting in further insecurity and protectionism. How can we break the spiral? as we tackle these threats and recover the five years of development lost to COVID-19. The interconnected threats we face demand a new approach to human security in the Anthropocene. A community can only be secure if adjacent communities and natural systems are too. New threats to human security in the Anthropocene calls for a greater focus on solidarity and agency in policymaking. We must expand the human security concept to consider not just interdependence across people, but also between people and the planet, and create the trust needed for people to collaborate in solving humanity's greatest challenges. Thank you very much. Um, as you have seen in the video, when UNDP first defined uh, human security in its 1994 Human Development Report, it really started challenging already at that time the prevailing focus on just simply territorial and physical security and reframing human security as freedom from fear, anxiety, want, and indignity. So in today's context, uh, many years later, um, despite the global challenges and the dramatic and unprecedented large-scale impacts of the war of, of, in Ukraine, we still strongly believe that this report is a useful addition to the traditional global debates on, on security. In Geneva, the International Geneva uh, provides us with the opportunity to adopt a truly integrated approach to security 
and the debates today um, are a key opportunity to bring together different communities working on the peace, health, climate, and de development dimensions of international governance. So uh, without further ado, I'm very pleased to have a number of high-level representatives here as well as our panel. So a special welcome to Ambassador Jörg Glauber from the, the permanent representative of Switzerland to the UN, who will also provide his perspectives at the end of the event. And Ambassador Thomas Greminger, who is the director of the Geneva Center for Security and Peace and uh, a great appreciation for co-organizing this event with us. Um, this UNDP report is timely and brings a number of innovations in the context of, of, um, of the development analysis in the age of the humans. And my colleague, uh, Pedro Concesao, director of the UNDP Development Report Office uh, based in New York and online with us today, will soon highlight the key messages of the report. Um, then we will have an interactive uh, dialogue uh, and uh, Anna, will, Anna Brach, the head of the human security team at GCSP, will uh, moderate the panel and who will introduce our distinguished panel members after. But before that, I would like to pass the floor to our host, the director of the Geneva Center for Security Policy, Ambassador Thomas Greminger, who would walk us through the continuous importance of the concept of human security in the current context. Over to you. Thank you. So, uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear friends, welcome uh, to the Maison de la Paix. Uh, welcome to the Geneva Center for Security Policy, also on my behalf. Happy to have you here. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you today uh, during the International Geneva launch event of the UNDP Special Report on Human Security. We gather today in the heart of International Geneva and online to celebrate the reaffirmation of human security as a crucial approach to addressing today's challenges to security and peace. I would like to focus my remarks on three points. First, on the importance of human security within the framework of a comprehensive uh, approach to security. And I'll tell you in a moment what I mean by that. Second, on the evolution of violent conflict and the imperative of the human security approach for prevention. And third, on human security in the context uh, of the current situation of Russia's war against Ukraine and what this means for wider uh, European security challenges. First, yes, we live in challenging times indeed. And this uh, war ongoing in midst of Europe for three weeks now is a shocking reminder of it. These challenging times remind us of the importance of human security in a comprehensive approach to security. And as the report highlights, ensuring that people live free from want, free from fear and indignity requires a comprehensive, a systemic approach. The interconnectedness of global issues that we face today underlines that we can no longer address these threats individually but require cooperation and solidarity among all relevant stakeholders. Looking at the current security landscape, we can only conclude that we need a comprehensive approach to security, integrating national state aspects of security and human security. It is imperative to engage in a comprehensive analysis and engage in comprehensive policies that factor in all aspects of insecurity. The report's findings revealing that more than six out of seven people feeling insecure in the pre-pandemic period, I think these findings are alarming. At the same time, they remind us of the urgency to increase human security comprehensively. 
I can personally attest to that after having worked all along my professional career in positions where comprehensive solutions were indeed essential. I have uh, uh, come to the understanding that we really need to go beyond this conventional dichotomy between traditional state uh, uh, driven security and human security. We need to realize that this is no longer an either or, but an and question. All current challenges to security and peace have aspects of both a traditional state and human security and need therefore to be addressed holistically. This requires increased dialogue and cooperation between states, but also the inclusion of all other relevant stakeholders. In terms of topics, this implies uh, looking at topics ranging from classic disarmament issues to questions of environmental degradation and even moving beyond our planet to outer space. Combining traditional and human security policies makes it possible to work on different governance levels and integrate top-down and bottom-up approaches. For example, in building sustainable peace in post-conflict countries and regions, such multi-layered approaches to security policies are invaluable. Such an approach will also allow the integration of various security challenges such as violent conflict, but also radicalization and extremism, health, environment, while addressing them in a systematic and interconnected way. Secondly, this comprehensive approach to security integrating human security into mainstream security policy has never been more critical than in the context of conflicts. As illustrated in the report, there is an increasing number of people affected by conflict. According to UNDP's statistical findings, today, one out of four people is affected by conflict, one out of four. In 2020, forcibly displaced people fleeing from conflict reached 82.4 million. Meanwhile, we witness uh, an increase of inequalities exacerbated by conflict, the COVID pandemic and environmental threats. And as we speak, hundreds of people are forced to leave their homes due to these increasing threats and conflicts. And needless to mention, the devastating impacts on human lives and environment. Human security can offer solutions as this concept is rooted in prevention. And as underlined by the UN Secretary General uh, in his uh, very first uh, UN Security Council address, prevention is, and I quote, not merely a priority but key priority. He called for a whole new approach to shift from the current trend of spending more time and resources on conflict rather than preventing them. And humanity is currently learning its painful lessons. We failed to prevent wars in Syria, Yemen, Somalia, Afghanistan, and uh, most recently in Ukraine. The question, of course, is, whether accepting and adopting the human, the human security uh, approach uh, in national security policies would help prevent such conflicts in the future. I would argue that ensuring human security by empowering individuals and protecting them from the various threats could create enabling conditions for the well-being, for their well-being and also for the states they reside in. I'm saying this while acknowledging the revival of geopolitics and great power rivalry in the recent decade. But as per the famous Albert Einstein quote, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them, end of quote. The current security landscape obliges us 
to reconsider our thinking about security and to find ways with which we can build a much needed uh, comprehensive approach integrating uh, uh, all aspects, both traditional state and uh, human uh, aspects of security. And I would argue with the notion of cooperative security as a unifying idea. Lastly, and very much uh, in the same uh, vein, I would like to uh, address the current situation in Ukraine, where we are witnessing dramatic impacts uh, of the war on both state and human aspects of security. Since the conflict outbreak two weeks ago, three weeks ago now, um, more than five million people had to leave their homes in Ukraine. Three million of them had to flee as refugees abroad. Uh, others moved as displaced to other places uh, in uh, their country, leaving countless human lives vulnerable while facing fear, want, and indignity. According to uh, UN High Commissioner Filippo Grandi, this is the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II. As a result, human security of the Ukrainian population is gravely affected in both uh, freedom from fear and freedom from want, as it is exposed to constant military attacks. I'm often asked, is there a risk that it could get even worse? And Yes, there is a realistic risk that relations between Russia and the West could get even worse. My assumption is that once this hot war is over, and I hope rather sooner than later, uh, we will find ourselves uh, in something like a Cold War 2.0 with severe consequences on political relations, uh, on the global economy, on security policy, but also on our capacities to deal with global challenges, uh, like, for instance, uh, uh, climate change. I would argue that one of the reasons why we are in this mess is the failure of states to realize the merits of dialogue and cooperation and to take security for granted. There is perhaps, and this is the optimist speaking, an opportunity in this risk, in this crisis. The crisis might lead to states' realization and, and appreciation, at least in the medium to longer term, of the imperative of dialogue uh, and, and cooperation. However, it should not take a war to alert us to the necessity of rebuilding the trust and security uh, on our continent and beyond. In conclusion, what, uh, dear colleagues, will future historians say of us? That we wasted the opportunity to adapt and create a peaceful world, that we failed to prevent and resolve conflicts that led to wider wars, or will they say that we learned from history, that we understood the imperative of integrating the human security approach to make prevention, dialogue, and cooperation uh, uh, possible. Let us work hard together to make sure it is the latter, the second option. With this in mind, I'm very excited, uh, uh, and now I'm trying to become a bit more optimistic uh, in, in tone. Uh, I'm very excited uh, about today's launch of the UNDP special report on new threats to human security in the Apro Ant Anthropocene. That's a, a new concept for me, uh, even though I've been dealing with uh, uh, 
uh, human security since 1994. Um, I believe that uh, the findings of this report will allow us to update our understanding of human security um, to our uh, current realities and also uh, provide us with innovative suggestions on how uh, we can overcome human in insecurity by uh, tackling today's interconnected threats. And if uh, I have uh, uh, properly understood uh, the uh, procedures this afternoon, I would now hand over to Pedro Concesan, the director of the Human Development Report Office. And I thank you for your attention. Uh, Ambassador Greminger, thank you so much for uh, that wonderful introduction and uh, for inviting me to share the findings of the report. Uh, uh, we heard from my colleague Agi already uh, and from you um, a lot about what the report has to say, so I think I can be uh, relatively brief. Uh, let me also uh, thank the Geneva Center for Security Policy and my colleagues in Geneva for co-hosting this launch, and I look very much forward to the discussion um, with the panel uh, that is uh, participating in Geneva. So uh, as we've heard uh, uh, several times already, uh, human security uh, was uh, introduced in a human development report, uh, and I think this is important because it's a concept that comes from the human development uh, approach. Um, uh, uh, a while ago, almost 30 years ago, uh, but we, we felt uh, that it, it was acquiring, it was an idea, human security was an idea that was acquiring heightened relevance uh, in today's world. Um, as, as we've heard already, human security adds to concerns with um, territorial security, a focus on people. Uh, and it asks uh, if people are free from want, free from fear, and free from indignity. So this language, these words, draw very much from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and they also point directly uh, to the United Nations Charter, where uh, sometimes we forget, but uh, where development, peace, and human rights were seen as integrated and, and self-reinforcing. Now, as um, uh, Ambassador Greminger already alluded to, we found that even before the tragedy currently unfolding uh, in Ukraine, uh, and even before COVID-19, uh, um, we are not, we were not doing, the world was not doing very well on human security. Uh, six out of every seven people, as we've heard uh, globally, were already feeling insecure about many uh, aspects of their life. Now, this is in a context where uh, average standards of living, health, and education, despite uh, ongoing and sometimes increasing inequalities, were actually the highest on record. Uh, moreover, some of the highest increases in perceptions of human insecurity uh, were taking hold in countries with very high levels of the uh, Human Development Index. Uh, in fact, just last week, uh, uh, the results of a new survey here in the United States, where I'm addressing you from, found that 87% of uh, adults in the United States feel that there has been a constant stream of crisis without a break for the last two years, and that includes already uh, uh, the tragedy in the Ukraine, the war in the Ukraine. Uh, almost two-thirds agree that life since COVID-19 pandemic uh, started has been uh, a blur. But why are people feeling insecure? Uh, we argue in the report that there are very good and objective reasons for this. Uh, the result, uh, as we already heard from uh, Ambassador, uh, Ambassador Greminger, from the intersection on the one hand of the Anthropocene reality, this strange word, uh, uh, with inequality. So we argue that it's the intersection of these two things that uh, is at the root of uh, uh, this new heightened sense of uh, human insecurity. So what is the, the Anthropocene? Um, we think it's a useful frame uh, to bring together a, a range of challenges uh, from COVID-19, which uh, may um, very well be the latest in a series of uh, zoonotic diseases, to climate change and uh, biodiversity loss. So all of these issues are addressed separately 
but we argue that there are all manifestations of a broader process of planetary change that is making for a much more dangerous world. Um, moreover, these dangers carve deeper inequalities between those that contribute to the dangers, to the pressures that lead to these dangers, and those uh, and those suffered, suffering the consequences. Uh, for example, in the special report, we find that up to 40 million deaths can be attributed to climate change by the end of this century, overwhelmingly in countries with low levels of the Human Development Index, even with moderate action uh, uh, to mitigate climate change. So this report documents how this, this, this dynamic uh, is uh, of, of new dangers uh, along with inequalities is playing out through disruptions to food systems, uh, the forced displacement of, of people, new health threats, uh, the ampli amplification of triggers of violent conflict. Ambassador Greminger already alluded to uh, the estimates uh, in the report that we currently have 1.2 billion people that are affected by conflict, many indirectly, uh, and that moreover, half of these uh, 1.2 billion people live in countries in contexts that are not traditionally considered as being fragile or conflict affected. Um, uh, the destruction of physical natural capital is also explored in the report, the erosion of the ability of people to work, and a, a continued assault on human dignity through discrimination based on race, gender, and sexual orientation. Uh, moreover, and this is a, an idea that uh, Ambassador Greminger already alluded to, these challenges are interlinked and connected in many different ways, and uh, they propagate uh, across countries and across, across sectors uh, very rapidly. So if we take COVID-19, uh, which again may very well be one of the possible manifestations of this new context uh, of the Anthropocene, we know that it started as a health concern in a particular part of the world, but it uh, quickly spread globally and it multiplied from a health into a global economic recession uh, and also an unprecedented education crisis as schools around the world closed or went into remote learning. Uh, and the implications uh, of this uh, are still hard to, to fully grasp and unknown. So the report also offers uh, a way forward um, that's um, uh, uh, hopeful, uh, we, we believe. Uh, it starts by reaffirming uh, the importance of pursuing human security strat strategies to protect and empower people. So this idea that's about protection and empowering people uh, that were emphasized by uh, Sadako Ogata and Amartya Sen uh, almost 20 years ago when they led uh, um, a report called Human Security Now remains central. Uh, but our special report suggests two extensions. First, it argues that we have a blind spot in measuring progress and assessing policies by focusing on well-being achievements. And the findings that even well -being, when well-being achievements are high, people sometimes feel insecure, points to the potential neglect of agency. Uh, agency is the ability of people to make different choices, course correct, and uh, it seems that we often see people as patients, not, a, uh, not agents, able to reason and act to shape different futures. So this is the first blind spot, perhaps a neglect of agency. And secondly, uh, we argue that in addition to the empowerment and protection of individuals, human security strategies should seek to advance uh, solidarity. Uh, now we use the word solidarity in a, in a way that uh, should not be seen as something like optional charity or something that subsumes the individual to the interests of a collective, but really as a recognition of our interdependence in one another uh, and also between people uh, and planet, uh, as very much recognized in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. To conclude, um, uh, one of the main findings of the report uh, is that we find a very strong association between people feeling insecure and low levels of trust in one another. And this is a, an association that we find at the individual level. So the unit of analysis here are people, individual people, not countries. 
so this association between uh, people feeling insecure and the levels of trust holds regardless of where people live, uh, how satisfied they are with their lives. Uh, therefore, uh, uh, as we confront a world of uh, rising geopolitical tensions, uh, enhancing human security may offer a, a, a route towards rebuilding trust. Um, this also echoes a priority highlighted uh, by the United Nations Secretary General's recent report on our common agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I will now invite the panel to take their seats at uh, these beautiful red chairs. Please follow me. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Anna Brach, and I'm the head of human security here at the GCSP. I have the pleasure and privilege of moderating this excellent panel uh, to discuss uh, further the certain issues that were covered by the special report. Uh, I just wanted to share with you that me personally, I was very happy to see this report appearing because uh, we are finding it increasingly difficult to find really an updated approach to human security. So I think this is really timely that this report came out right now and especially with a special focus on the Anthropocene. So before uh, we start, I just have a very uh, um, short uh, housekeeping announcement for my speakers uh, because we will ask you to speak uh, to the microphone for the sake of our online audience. We are really greeting uh, all of you here at the GCSP, as well as uh, the around 200 people gathering uh, online in front of Zoom. So before we start again, we are going to cover uh, three topics in this, uh, in this panel, climate change, uh, health, and uh, new technologies. And I will turn to our first speaker immediately, uh, Ambassador Hoy Stemu, who's the Deputy Permanent Representative of the United Republic of Tanzania to the UN here in Geneva. And in her extensive experience, uh, she played a critical role to promote the work of UN agencies among citizens of your country, Ambassador, and to improve ties among more than 23 agencies in your country. And through uh, your background in diplomacy, corporate affairs management, you are also very active in integrating UN sustainable development goals in various sectors um, uh, to actively integrate in the, in the UN. So our first question here is really to hear from you from the perspective of Tanzania, but also as a representative of, of Global South more broadly, uh, to speak to us uh, about the these new threats detailed in the report, such as climate change and pandemics and how they impact your country. And as well, to talk to us a little bit about this dichotomy between the security and uh, um, development. So how come, uh, even though there was an acceleration in human development, uh, people are still feeling insecure? So the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Anna, and a very good afternoon uh, to you. Excellencies were here with us and um, thank you so much to you director for giving uh, me this chance and a very good afternoon and good morning for others who have joined us uh, online. Um, uh, it is very uh, true that uh, climate change, the pandemic and the human development aspect has really taken the world uh, in a different aspect and it's not uh, specifically in one country or one continent but the difference here is that uh, the levels are different uh, a bit uh, different and let me put uh, my views in the African continent um, from the report the three main impacts of climate threats uh, that um, the world is facing and uh, what are the basically the first one is the risk the cause, uh, the lead cause of displacement uh, is also uh, the climate uh, change uh, impact. And uh, from the report, uh, I've noted that uh, at least uh, 1 billion people worldwide 
uh, could be forced uh, in the displacement by 20, 2050 if, if something is not, uh, is not done. And um, in Tanzania, as one of the countries in sub-Saharan, uh, we have experienced a lot of uh, droughts, a lot of heavy, heavy rains. And uh, sometimes this, uh, we have seen a lot of um, animals uh, dying in the livestock community, in the livestock, uh, 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 the communities that are really uh, fully fledged, like the Maasai's and other people. Uh, who are depending on livestock. A lot of livestock died because of uh, the climate action that it was very dry sometimes, the floods, and then the impact of the disease and the control at the same, at the same time was, uh, was a call for the, for the, for the government to, to, to see what can be done better. But um, working with the international organizations, working with other stakeholders, uh, the, the mitigations and adaptation uh, go, have been going on. And um, example, I like to use the, an example of a Lake Victoria. Lake Victoria in Tanzania is one of the largest lakes in Lake Victoria. We have witnessed also the, the lower levels of water. The water is now going lower, even though also when it rains, it rains like it's, it affects it's over rained, like it's too much rain happening at, sa at the same time. So controlling these things uh, requires an action, not only for a government itself, but many, many stakeholders. The other uh, aspect on the view of this report that I would like to touch upon is uh, the impact of climate change that can disrupt the food and water systems that uh, we understand the world report also shows that seven, 75% of the fresh of the waters are, um, uh, on the crop, uh, I, I expect, I, how do I use this word? Uh, used in uh, livestock uh, in 75%. And uh, it is estimated that at least 2.3 billion people uh, are living in the areas of the water stressed areas. And what does it mean for, for, for us and the climate change that, uh, it is imperative we now, as stakeholders, as the country, not only country, but the world, uh, to ensure that this cannot continue to affect the socioeconomic livelihoods of many people and communities around, around the world. And uh, to tell you the truth, for, for Tanzania, we are facing, we, we face that because we have regions that we have a lot of people who are living in um, the dry areas. And we had uh, the, the lead director saying it very well, that the impact is happening mostly in the uh, low human development with the low human development index. And uh, Tanzania and other countries in sub-Saharan are not, are not um, uh, exempted from that. And let me talk about the other uh, uh, view on the report on the issue of uh, the effects of this, uh, the impact, act, the impact, the, the climate change impact and the pandemic on the issue of health and biodiversity. That the loss of land and the use of change, the changes, the different usages and changes sometimes uh, tend to uh, increase the zonic diseases as uh, we have had and the uh, ex exposure of human uh, pollutions uh, through air pollution. And we've seen, we have witnessed that sometimes even workers and labor had been impacted on this change of, of weather. So beyond the link of climate threat, uh, uh, deep human security crisis in sub-Saharan uh, Africa, uh, it's, it is not something that we can pass. And um, while the world is looking at um, many, many alternatives to things like uh, COVID um, vaccines, second job, second, uh, third job. There are many countries and Tanzania is one of them that we have not even reached the 50% of the vaccination to our people. So what does it tell that if we are not safe, uh, you will not be safe. And if you, you are not, you are safe, we will not, we will be safe if we all work together. And this is the part and parcel of the issue of now uh, solidarity, uh, what we have had, that we have to come together on this inclusiveness and so on, given that our country's government continues to do a lot to ensure that we raise awareness, but also looking for the, uh, for more support on the COVID 
but also the climate change towards the, the human development. And this is including working with stakeholders. We have the environment uh, plan for five year, for four years on uh, under the Ministry of uh, Vice President's Office, which was led by our current president, uh, who is a woman. And we have read on the report that women again get most uh, most affected on the on this uh, on these issues of climate change, as well as many inequalities are happening with that, which I will address this to a, to a second time. So we are part of the Kyoto Protocol. We are part of UNFCC, and uh, we are we are keen to see the the inclusion of this uh, adaptation, but also awareness is happening in our own country. We are ensuring that people understand and uh, this issue of cut tree, plant a tree, but as again, why cutting a tree if we have other alternative, alternative energy source and energy usage instead of using charcoal to towards uh, cooking and many things. And these are the other part that you see, we are working not only with the government as government, but partners uh, in the sense of international organizations. And um, um, I'm happy to inform you that uh, 10 years of working with UNDP, um, we have done a lot with our government. And um, it is something that uh, we are keen also to include the youth, uh, but also development partners and academicians to ensure that climate action and climate change uh, is mitigated and the adaptation um, issues or key actions are taken into point to ensure that the world is free from more dangers related to climate change. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ambassador. And I think that this is really important when, and this is what uh, Ambassador Gremingen also mentioned, this work across different actors, different stakeholders that is really crucial in addressing human security challenges and security in a comprehensive way. We will be moving on to our second speaker, and we are going to be discussing health, so very much also related to what, what um, Ambassador said. Uh, Ms. Harahes, who is a technical officer at the World Economic Organization, she works with the Epidemic Pandemic Preparedness and Prevention at Health Emergencies Program, so a lot to do right now. Uh, she's a public health professional with experience on other issues as well, HIV AIDS, hepatitis, and infectious hazard uh, management. Sarah, uh, I really wanted to ask you about, you know, what's happening now in terms of uh, COVID pandemics. So the, the report is probably most of you have read that it has a full chapter dedicated to health security and health security is one of the main uh, challenges to human security that we are facing right now. So what would be, uh, from your point of view, like the key, key aspect of the COVID pandemic that have had the great impact, greatest impact on human security? Mm. Thanks very much, Anna, and um, hello to everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here today. Um, just a, a quick clarification, not the World Economic Organization. <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> but I think everybody picked that up. Um, I think, I mean, much of what I would say on to answer that question echoes what's already been said, I think. Um, I think first and foremost, the, the greatest impact is really coming from the economic impact that's sending so many people into poverty. Um, and I think, I mean, it's been well documented that I'm not going to go into details about it. But the second one, which is again um, linked to this, but probably rooted in more systemic issues, is the increase in um, inequalities that we've seen. Um, existing inequalities, but new inequalities. And I think unless recovery and um, socioeconomic responses are done with an equity lens, um, we're not gonna, we're gonna be repeating mistakes again a second time um, if there is another outbreak, um, which undoubtedly there will be. I think the third uh, key thing that we've learned through, through the pandemic is related to issues about trust. I think we've seen a massive trust crisis emerging. Trust, not just in science, but which is something that of course at WHO we felt hugely, but trust in institutions, trust in leadership. Um, and I think, um, and uh, perhaps my panelists here will speak to this, but we're navigating a really complicated information ecosystem at the moment, which um, I think with a massive amount of information, good and bad, that's circulating in digital and, and physical spaces. And I think this is one of the 
the big challenges that we have to face because this does contribute to breakdown in trust um, at many, many levels. In addition to that, the kind of politicization of, of many aspects of the response. And, and I think, uh, you know, fundamental to the work of, of recovery is going to have to be building back uh, trust in all these aspects. So I think those three, to me, those three things would be sort of key lessons that are not just health related, but uh, I think Thank you so much. And I have a second question for you more in terms of looking forward. How do you see WHO, so World Health Organization, and other uh, actors working in this area, um, you know, what would be the next steps that they have to take now to, to precisely prevent you know, the problems that you just mentioned for the future pandemics and for future other health security uh, challenges, because pandemics is not the only one, right? Yeah, very no, thank you, Anna. I mean, I think we're, we, we have an incredible opportunity at the moment. We're at this juncture where um, unless we take stock of the, the gains that have been made during the pandemic and really make a concerted effort to both optimize and sustain them, again, we run the risk of having to reinvent the wheel repeatedly at, at subsequent events. So I think what we're trying to do um, as we move into quite a complicated um, area going forward into this year we have I mean I think most people are aware uh, there were a lot of independent reviews that were done some of them were in the report um, around the pandemic preparedness um, and response mechanisms you know the we have that intergovernmental negotiating body that's uh, looking at uh, an international instrument for pandemic preparedness that's going to go to the World Health Assembly in May so that's going to change things and you know along along with that there's the the discussions around financing and the global health architecture and and this is while this is all happening at that policy level it, it, it's still a, a, a big opportunity for us to rethink things and to do things uh, slightly differently so i think a lot of the work that we're doing now is really that looking at what's happened what are the get the gains that have been made not just on a very technical level i mean we've seen huge um technological advances in genomic sequencing for surveillance on it you know on a very specific level that that we we can maintain um but but also you know advances in in approaches that the whole concept around solidarity and making sure that um, we are addressing everything with an equity lens. Um, issues around research and development. We've seen unprecedented advances in research and development for the vaccines. But um, it's you know let's sustain it. We could have better vaccines, therapeutics, and um, we're going to be living with COVID for a while. So there's no need to for that to wane. We can you know, continue that, and um, you know alongside of that, with the equity lens, it's the whole technology transfer. Um, space as well so making sure like the manufacture the vaccine manufacturing hub in in south africa that this is a model that can be replicated in other parts of the world to ensure um, sustainability and, and agency national agency as well um, so yeah the research and development the the surveillance gains um, i would say you know having like i said in the in answer to the first question having um trust building back trust as a as a fundamental component underpinning all the the work that we do and then these multi multilateral mechanisms to ensure that we're working together towards common go goals of which you know the an, an international instrument is one but there are there are many others that are currently being um, discussed at WHO for example the biohub which is something for the sharing of, of biological materials of uh, pathogens of pandemic potential to allow rapid research and development this is another um, sort of multilateral initiative and and so yeah i mean i could i, I know we've, we're short on time and I, I could go on but i think those are some of the, the more popular things that we're thinking. thank you so much sarah for the, for this and uh, we will come back to you i hope in the in the q and a but now i will wanted to move to our third speaker uh, um, professor jovan kurvalia who's the executive director of diplo foundation uh, 
a neighbor from uh, here, the, the, the Maison de la Paix, head of Geneva Internet Platform. Uh, he also served as co-executive director of the UN Secretary General's high-level panel on digital cooperation and a special advisor to the chairman of the UN Internet Governance Forum. So what was what I found really interesting in the in the special report is that it's I, I think the first uh, report on human security that mentions new technologies. And I really wanted to ask you to reflect on um, some of these unintended consequences of new technologies challenging human security. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. It's not only that it mentioned, but it mentioned in the right way because it moved beyond the traditional security issue, cybersecurity, let's say first committee agenda it moved to the second, third, uh, even sixth committee when you in the UN lingo. But basically it covered the uh, digital cyber e-tech, whatever uh, prefix you use, it covered in a comprehensive way. And it is the first good news and congratulations for drafters of the report. And uh, uh, that I will start with good news. Now I have some other good news in this time when we have uh, all of this terrible and bad news Another good news uh, which uh, coincided with uh, this launch of the, of the report is the fact that uh, internet digital tech survived so far one tough test of the global crisis. During the COVID crisis, the digital platforms were the way that uh, uh, help us to continue functioning as society. Through Zoom meetings that we are now using, through remote work uh, with the other activities. There are many pros and cons and the gains and the losses in the terms of human interaction, but we have to acknowledge it that uh, digital infrastructure global became a critical infrastructure for functioning of society and it worked more or less well. Second tough uh, test is unfortunately happening now with the Ukraine war. But so far, internet is passing this test. In spite of all uh, problems, attacks, cyber attacks, and the problems so far, it's possible for citizen in Moscow to send email, and I'm highlighting citizen, to uh, his uh, friend or colleague in Kharkov or, uh, or uh, Kiev or any other place. Internet is still one of the few remaining global infrastructures that function. We know that even UN is challenged with UN Security Council in crisis with many meetings, we know that uh, economic transactions are challenged and uh, energy system works here and there, but internet is so far functioning infrastructure. And there was a call uh, from uh, Ukrainian government, which is obviously under a hell lot of stress, to disconnect uh, to ICANN, which is the global body, which deals with basically internet name, names and numbers, to disconnect uh, Russian domains. Uh, I can and general internet community pushed back. And uh, it is not the first time that there were calls to disconnect the whole country to use the killer switch. It happened with uh, Iraq, ex Yugoslavia, Libya, more or less all major conflicts. But we always forget that, uh, uh, often forget in this discussion, that in this case, US government played the role of benevolent guardian of the internet with many pro and cons and criticism. But even in the case of ex-Yugoslavia, which I studied quite in details, when there were sanctions, UN-based sanctions, according to chapter seven of the UN charter, and possibility in this chart is clearly written that you can disconnect telecommunications. It didn't happen. And this is what I said, this is a good news. There are obviously, uh, we are following the news and we are following of disconnection of filtering of attacks of cyber attacks and that's that's basically but with with good news let me now shift to the real challenges and the points which were mentioned by the drafter of the of the report although i will have small co uh, comment on anthropocene not to be too pedantic but there is one important comment uh, which is which is important to keep in mind what is basically happening is that uh, Challenges across the board are huge. And you use in your right, and I'm addressing the drafter and all who drafted, you use a lot, but. Technology brings advantages, but. Quantum computing uh, can help us to do crypto protection, but. And this interplay is typical for the digital discussions. And here is the key issue. 
We speak about digital binary ones and zeros, but challenges are analog. Challenges are challenges of very difficult and delicate trade-offs. Countries can become digitally independent, technically, it's possible, but the cost is huge for economy, for connection with diaspora. Uh, I'll just mention one example. When the President Trump tried to disconnect WeChat uh, uh, in the United States, there were about uh, a Chinese community which is connected with the internet more than 80 million people worldwide, we say, hey, we use integrated internet. And it's also pressure on the government in Beijing. Therefore, those trade-offs are very delicate. Economic, social, we speak about Switzerland, huge diaspora, huge service industry. Well, Switzerland doesn't have these ideas to disconnect from the internet. But many governments and many communities are making this challenge. This is the first point. Second point uh, is that uh, Geneva is a place where we can help addressing digital issues in the analog way by having the basically move beyond the council culture in diplomacy, hearing the other side, engaging, uh, hearing the science, hearing the different actors. And this is unique role of Geneva, traditional and historical, especially in the crisis time. And the last point, uh, Anna and, uh, and the other uh, colleagues, uh, there is one word which was missing in the report. Now, let me be a bit of critical, uh, yes. sort of. Is a social contract uh, word, which came in the, uh, our common agenda by UN Secretary General. Governments worldwide are missing on delivering on social contract in digital field. They cannot protect their citizens. And it's quite a basic, you know, from Hobbes, Leviathan, we pay taxes and we vote and governments have to deliver us uh, safety, uh, well, well-functioning society, democracy if it is possible, market and other things. Governments cannot deliver on that. And it's a huge challenge ahead of us. And the last comment uh, for the drafters, probably people from international geo, uh, geo, geological society will complain because they argue that we are still in Holocena which started with the glacial age, and they have a long debate, are we entering Anthropocene and not? And that's, that's but I won't uh, bother uh, with this way. Maybe to use the next time concept of no sphere by the French uh, Teilhard de Chardin, uh, who basically argued that we have geosphere, land, biosphere, where we are part of the, and we have no sphere. No sphere, the space of human creativity, knowledge, spirituality. He coined this together with Russian geologist uh, Vernetsky. And maybe this is just idea for the next report to, to use the less controversial term of no sphere. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor. And I do have many other questions, but I'm very conscious of time. We did start a little bit late, but uh, I wanted to advance this conversation and leave some space for Q&A. But before that, I wanted to invite to the podium Ambassador Jörg Lauber, uh, the permanent representative of Switzerland to the UN in Geneva. Thank you uh, very much, Anna. Thanks uh, for having me. I feel a bit uh, but I always feel like interrupting a, a very lively discussion. And uh, I also want to echo Thomas's uh, expression of how uh, you said you were excited to be here. I feel, I'm, I feel the same. And I, the, the longer I uh, listen to the presentations and discussions, the more excited I, I got. But I have to make a confession also. I'm, I'm really only now working my way through the report. Um, not just reading it, but also trying to absorb it and, and, um, and trying to figure out what it means uh, for me and for us. I, I have a hunch, though, that it, it couldn't be timelier. You know, the, the, the war in, in Ukraine is without any doubt also a terrible blow to, to multilateralism. And I read the report also as, a, as an appeal and, and a confirmation also for the need of a renewal of multilateralism, of international cooperation uh, in, in a better form, uh, maybe more, more solidarity in the international system. So with the report, uh, UNDP invites us to reflect on the approach to development in an era characterized by uncertainty, complexity, growing perceptions of insecurity, 
and marked by a global decline in trust. You all mentioned this uh, in your discussion so far. The report calls to revamp the thinking of security, better taking into account planetary considerations and human development. This call is not theoretical, but it is certainly ambitious and it has obvious and practical applications for us here in International Geneva. With the war in Ukraine and its immediate dramatic human impacts, we are witnessing the system interaction, the systemic sorry, interaction of armed conflict with other threats to human security at local, regional and global level. But then I don't want to sound too positive at this point, but the war in, in Ukraine also sort of shows that when confronted with a major crisis, the world, people, civil society and governments can mobilize resources very quickly. And we collectively need to adopt a similar sense of urgency and use a strategy of solidarity to respond to the interconnected threats faced by the people and the planet at the global scale. A broad set of threats is indeed affecting the security of individuals and communities across the world, as noted by the speakers and discussants. These threats include public health emergencies, climate and environmental issues, violation of human rights or new technology challenges. All of these threats go beyond the protection of state sovereignty and the traditional state-centric approach to security. For instance, the latest IPPC climate report launched in Geneva a few weeks ago showed widespread and pervasive impacts of climate change on people. Both the IPCC and the UNDP Special Report on Human Security explicitly set out in the strongest terms that the climate crisis is inseparable from the biodiversity crisis and the poverty and inequality suffered by billions of people around the world. An integrated approach is therefore key. In today's world of pandemics, conflicts and interconnected crises and risks, we need a fresh approach. UNDP Pedro this afternoon proposed during his presentation a new framework, solidarity as a strategy for human security, in addition to existing concepts of protection and empowerment. It means that the current multilateral system built to save future generations from the scourge of war needs to evolve to face these new threats. The conclusions of the report and our discussions invite us to move beyond considering the security of individuals and communities to also consider the interdependence among people and between people and planet as reflected in the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. In the context of the current world affairs, we should put an emphasis on human security in our efforts to reinvigorate multilateralism. Switzerland takes a, simil a similar approach in the framework of our candidacy to the UN Security Council for 23-24. We are committed to placing people at the center and promote a multidimensional approach of risks, including through a better understanding of climate change and its impacts on peace. Since 2017, Switzerland has also adopted a holistic approach in its foreign policy, which reflects the importance attached to the humanitarian development and peace nexus. As an example, I would like to mention the Blue Peace Initiative, which promotes common management of shared water resources to meet the needs of local communities, to reduce tensions and to promote stable relations between different states and stakeholders. Now, what does it mean uh, for us in Geneva? I think it's fair to say that in Geneva, many agencies have started to pay closer attention to this triple nexus between humanitarian development and peace. This approach indicates not only the importance of physical safety, but also the need to guarantee a minimum of economic, social, political and cultural freedoms in promoting a peaceful and just future for all. Switzerland is pleased to work closely with UNDP to promote such an integrated approach and strive to reduce fragilities for long-term development. In the era of, and I hope I can pronounce it, Anthropocene, we are invited to go beyond securing individuals and the most vulnerable communities to systematically consider interdependence across all people and between people and the planet. 
We therefore need more cross-disciplinary collaboration. And I'd like to think that International Geneva is the perfect place to forge collaboration between a wide range of stakeholders because the stakeholders are here from all these different areas. Uh, we have the representatives here, but also because Geneva is close to the field or closer to the field, which allows us to see immediately what's the impact on the ground where it really matters. What argue you mentioned it in our discussion before, what works and what doesn't work and to take the lessons out of this. So to conclude, I would like to thank again GCSP and UNDP for bringing us together. Switzerland enjoys a very close collaboration with UNDP around the world to promote all facets of human security. And we look very much forward to the continuation of this strong partnership. Argue you said in the beginning, this is just the start of a conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Lauber. I will now ask you to take my seat and we are going to start the Q&A. So before we take the questions,